have presentations from many people on our board and chairs of many of the committees, so you'll get caught up on the, all the excitement that you missed in Boise. Just a reminder, while we're in the webinar, if you have a question, type it in the chat box. If you have some technical issues, you could send that to Becky Juleson privately, or if you want to send it to all of us, that's fine, too. Um, you can also use the Q&A box, but I think almost everyone is able to see the chat. The Q&A sometimes just goes to only the presenter, so if you want your question, if you want all the participants to see your question, be sure and type it in the chat box. And we will have time for questions after all of our speakers, um, so, but feel free to type a question in the chat box anytime during the webinar. Barbara, did you want me to go ahead and get underway? Uh, yes, I think wait? that would be a good idea. We'll, uh, we're having a, we have a couple more people signing on, but I think we could go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, turn the webinar over to COSA's president, Tim Baker, who's the State Archivist of Maryland. Thank you, well, Tim. You know, thank you, Barbara. I'm delighted to be with you all this afternoon. Thank you for joining with us. We've got a lot of information to cover for you, and I think you'll find it very interesting and rewarding. So let's get uh, right to it. Uh, this afternoon we're going to start off with a brief recap of our state board symposium uh, that was hosted with NHPRC out in Boise. We're also going to talk about the COSA work session, our business meeting, uh, our award recipients, some new and upcoming programming activities and updates. Uh, and then we're going to finish it up with a presentation from Steve Frizzell, who's with us from Axiom and Apex Software pre uh, President. So our, our first uh, presenter this afternoon is uh, the one and only uh, Dan Stokes from NHPRC. Dan? No, they can probably. Now you can probably hear. I see uh, the red X is gone. Um, I wanted to give just a few minutes here uh, a recap of the State Board Symposium and first to um, offer thanks to Anne and Barbara and Becky for all their support to put this on with arranging logistics and taking notes and helping with technology, which I don't do. So uh, it's good to have Becky there to help with that. Um, we had a, a very productive four hours. Um, the background on this is uh, that it's been a long time since we talked to the state coordinators, so uh, we wanted to get together with you all to bring up various issues. Plus, NHPRC has a new strategic plan that calls for working with state archives and state boards, and we wanted to kind of uh, find out the state of those institutions to find out what areas might um, need to be looked at. And also, over the past several years, we've tended to get a good bit of information from state boards that have an HPRC grants and not get a lot of information from others. So we're, we're working to um, kind of deal with, with that situation and getting information from all the state boards, whether they get grant funding or not. Um, some of the changes that came out of this that we're going to be able to implement rather quickly, um, first is uh, agreeing to have the state boards or uh, members of the state boards uh, review the draft applications that we receive in the um, records access area. Uh, since the full board no longer reviews the final applications, we're going to offer the opportunity for the full board or members of it, depends on what the state coordinator wants to do, to review the drafts. And that is something that's coming up very soon because the draft deadline is uh, next Tuesday, and so we'll be, I'll be sending these drafts out to the state coordinators um, likely either that Friday, next Friday, or the Monday or Tuesday after that, depending on when Alex Florich here on the staff is able to put all those together. So we'll be sending that out to you. And along with that, I'll be emailing to everybody kind of the new review policy so that you can get an idea 
uh, in detail of how you can handle these drafts. We will be continuing to request that you provide one or two board members to serve on a larger panel to review the final applications which come in in October. So I'll also be letting you know about that to uh, be ready for um, recommendations of names by then. Another area that we're going to implement quickly is development of a standard form that boards can use to report on their activities. The Commission really wants to know what boards are doing, not just what their grant activities are, but other activities. And so it's important that they get that information to kind of familiarize themselves with what boards are doing. And another area that we're going to implement quickly is um, when you get new board members or reappointed board members, uh, we will issue an appointment letter that kind of lets them know um, how to get information about the NHPRC more broadly. We depend on you to provide information to your individual board members on your specific board's activities, but we want to provide them with information on the NHPRC more broadly. And then we'll uh, investigate um, issuing uh, service certificates signed by the archivist when people have finished their tour of duty on the board so they have a recognition of the service that they provided. Um, other action items that can um, be implemented shortly um, after consult some consultation with a few coordinators um, is um, to find out what new and even current, <coughs> excuse me, current board members need in the way of information or training if it would be useful to have something like a webinar for um, reviewing grant proposals and other things. So we'll be uh, working with a few state boards to kind of draft some kind of a uh, letter that will go out to state board members to find out what would be useful to you as a new board member to uh, have training in our area. Longer term, uh, we're going to have to have a special group that will be looking at many um, issues that have come up um, as um, Ann and Barbara prepare their notes from the symposium and I do my notes as well as the uh, information that was on the uh, flip chart sheets that you all prepared. We're going to pull it together to find out um, what all that information is about um, and we'll provide that information to everyone. But we'll also have um, a select group that will be looking at issues such as what can boards be asked to do, what are their limits, um, what areas are best for them to work through, what are the resources that are necessary for them to become more effective, um, how can they share their successes and reach out to other folks uh, to, to address, help them address problems they may have, uh, recognizing that there are different boards in different states that have different levels of activity that they need to engage in and everybody, we're not going to have 56 uh, boards that are all the same and doing the same work and, and addressing the same needs. And uh, the issue of integrating the whole National Archives, NHPRC, State Archives, State Boards relationship and how that should work and how it can work best and how do we make sure that we recognize the work that each entity does and how they work together and uh, can become a, a more efficient uh, group together. So that's uh, my basic quickie uh, summary of the symposium. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, very nice presentation, and we're really uh, grateful to have you with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you for joining in on the call. Sure. Uh, so uh, for the next piece, uh, we're going to talk about our work session, and I'm going to focus on our State Electronic Records Initiative, or CERI. I want to first, I'll cover some of our recent activities. I'll then touch on what we think we need to do more moving forward. I'll talk a little bit about some of the grant opportunities that we're hopeful about. And uh, finally, I'm going to talk about where we need some help. So under our, the category of recent activities, I think most significantly uh, we welcomed uh, Barbara Teague as our consultant and mover and shaker extraordinaire. Under her leadership, with her leadership, uh, we've been able to publish uh, uh, 
to document a national risk, the State of State Electronic Records Report, which if you haven't downloaded a copy or received a copy and uh, looked through that document, I would very much encourage you to, to do so. We were also able to wrap up our IMLS grant, our Strategic uh, Training and Education Program, or the STEP report. Uh, those two activities in and of themselves, I think, are very significant and very helpful to our cause. And I thank Barbara for all her hard work on them. Under our uh, the, under the CERI committees, I'm going to start with advocacy and outreach. Uh, of course, we continue to uh, promote our Electronic Records Day, but uh, I think the webinar series aimed at local governments and state and local governments, I think, have been very successful. We featured a bring your own device, a webinar on social media, electronic records management systems, and a webinar on organizing electronic records, all the while tweeting away and planning for our next Electronic Records Day in 2017. We also um, did some spotlight blog articles, one on web harvesting and another from North Carolina on digital preservation. And we'd encourage anyone who uh, is interested in putting together a blog article to do so. Uh, you, you don't really have to have a, a completed, extraordinarily cool and uh, far out there state of the art uh, project to uh, write something up or, or to initiate a, a conversation about something you're working on. Uh, we're all about educating one another, so anything uh, that you can contribute I think is worth worthwhile. Under our Tools and Resources Committee activities, we're just wrapping up uh, a Best Practices for Digitization Project Management document that I think is in the final stages of uh, edit and will be put out there soon. Uh, our PERTS portal, we've uh, put together some uh, resources to reprogram and tweak some of the port, PERTS portal to provide some enhancements that uh, offer a more streamlined submission of resources. Uh, we've also added a star rating system so folks can tell us all what they find most helpful. And uh, we're really looking at some of the other resources vetted by staff and committee volunteers, up, updating. We, we've been, gone through a process of trying to find dead links and we're fixing them, so that's all, all good as well. Um, continuing with tools and resource, we're going to be working on some more best practices and structural, and structural documents um, on email management. We've talked about uh, blockchain technologies and we're looking for other issues and, and um, uh, topics to, to address. Under our education and programming, uh, we've expanded some of our webinar series with uh, COSA and uh, Preservica and did some briefings to our state budget decision makers, a briefing for state CIO and IT decision makers, a three-part online workshop for records officers at state agencies, and a series of how-to webinars for archivists and records uh, manager, uh, managers. So looking forward, I think the, our Siri committee and its subcommittees are really uh, going to be focused on continuing to promote awareness about the critical nature of managing, preserving electronic records and the urgent need for action. We will be collaborating with our allies and stakeholders, uh, think uh, the National Association of CIOs, Secretary of State, those kinds of entities. Um, we will want to create comprehensive and sustainable programming for electronic records management and digital preservation. And I guess 
perhaps most significantly, we really need to in, in, increase the engagement of uh, our COSIN members. And I'll talk about that in just a minute when I wrap up. So also looking forward, you should be aware that we have in the works, um, well, not in the works, in the hopper, uh, two grant applications, one a planning grant to assess a shared digital tools and testing environment. That's our, our test bed uh, grant. Also, we have a grant pending for implementing access, uh, guiding the creation, preservation, and use of electronic records. We're really hopeful about those grant applications. I think we'll hear about them within uh, a month or thereabouts. So uh, I'll, I'll say that whether or not we get these grants, I think our work plan uh, will look pretty much the same. I think we're, we're focused on on what we need to do moving forward, the grant will just uh, help determine how fast how fast we can get there. Uh, so the grants will impact the work plan from that perspective. But if we don't get them, it'll just be a slower slog. And and I th I feel so our our committee structure, the committees that I mentioned a minute ago, education and training, advocacy and outreach, tools and resources. That, that committee structure will probably remain pretty much the same with the steering committee uh, helping to direct those subcommittees. Um, but uh, what I think we probably need to do and what we talked about on a call this morning was trying to be a little bit more focused in terms of developing more distinct and, and task-oriented activities so our members of the subcommittees can participate in meaningful ways without getting overloaded. But that's where we need some help. Uh, we are a member organization that is made up of archivists and their staff. Um, and other than some wonderful help from our executive director, um, we're pretty much it. So I'd, I'd ask you to look at those committees. Uh, we'll probably want to circulate to the uh, our COSA listserv, a reminder of uh, what those committees are and what their charges, what their tasks are, and we'll be looking for folks to help join and uh, participate in those activities. So with that, I think I am going to um, turn it over to John Dugan and Jack Warner to continue our uh, presentation on the work session with a focus on the sustainability plan. Jack is not with us today, so it's just John uh, on the phone today. We had a great um, task force that helped us work on this uh, sustainability plan, and a lot of this was discussed in length um, through various means before. Um, the annual meeting, but it was approved at the annual meeting. Uh, just like with some of the Siri documentation, if you don't have a copy uh, of the sustainability plan, you can probably get that through Ann or our base camp website. Um, so the high points of that, though, as are shown on the slide, is the mission statement was revised, and at time, it really the, the the intention of it was to to focus the mission statement, to focus the sustainability plan. Uh, on um, some core functions that we see the Council of State Archivists uh, providing to the community. Um, those core functions being research, which is sort of new, um, that we had not really enumerated before, but we'd already been doing it, along with the education and advocacy um, that had been on previous plans. Um, so um, the one other um, uh, item of impact um, that is supported by the sustainability plan is, is as we seek a new executive director, uh, we are looking at a full-time executive director um, as part of that plan um, that they can do some things uh, for the board um, that a part-time executive director uh, could not do. So um, uh, that's, that's my report uh, for that. So I'll turn it back over to Tim, I believe. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, very well. I um, I have the pleasure uh, 
to announce our election results here. Uh, first, I am very pleased to uh, let you know that Jody Foley uh, from Montana and Lizette Pelletier from Connecticut are our new uh, board members elected to three-year terms. Uh, I should mention that Steve Murray from Alabama, our Secretary Treasurer, was uh, elected to continue in uh, on the board uh, as a uh, for a, for another one year uh, stint, uh, which will uh, allow him to continue to ably serve as our treasurer and secretary. So uh, congratulations to all of them. I'd also just like to uh, say that uh, our last presenter, John Dugan, uh, has been duly elected vice president and president elect. And we're very pleased to have all of those folks. And uh, I go, guess it goes without saying that uh, I was elected uh, president for this term. And I'm, I'm pleased to be able to serve. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our treasurer, Steve, for our, uh, Steve Murray, for our treasurer's report. Thanks, Tim. Uh, the slide on the screen in front of you now shows our financial uh, condition as of the end of 2015 and 2016. And we just want to review for you briefly where COSA stands. I think our financial health is, is good. Uh, I would point out uh, in 2016, we ended the year with just under $121,000 in cash, uh, a few other thousand dollars in accounts receivable. Uh, giving us some total current assets of 131,563. The next section of that slide shows our property and equipment. That's a, the value of those assets that depreciate over time. And then the, the next line shows the value of our investments at $87,252, giving you a total of $249,000. If you want to understand how much money COSA really has, you can subtract that $30,292 from the number at the bottom and that will tell you that we've got about $220,000 uh, that are available to COSA for its operations and other initiatives. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is showing, uh, again, ending in December of 2015 and 2016, respectively, what our liabilities and net assets were. Uh, one thing I would point out there is um, the deferred revenue, that $10,409 includes $7,500 of deferred revenue. Uh, we received $15,000 from SAA for our joint meeting last year, and we decided as an organization to carry half of that revenue forward into 2017. So most of that deferred revenue is made up of that half of the uh, shared revenue that we received from SAA for our joint meeting last year. Otherwise, uh, you get down to the bottom of that report and the 249 there of total liabilities and net assets equals uh, the number we saw on the previous slide, and that's divided between uh, operating funds and board designated funds. Those board designated funds include uh, an awards fund that we are continuing to build up and as well as a reserve fund that's been set aside by the board. We go to the next slide. Go uh, one back, Becky. There you go. Uh, this is showing three years of budget, so you can actually see our income and expenses over the course of 15, 16, and 17. And what's significant about uh, this, these numbers is that you can start to see as you look from left to right at that total support and revenue, uh, you can see COSA winding down from these last cycles of federal grants that we had. And uh, even though there was still about $30,000 in grant income uh, as we closed out our last IMLS grant in 2017, if you were to subtract that number, you get down to the somewhere in the range of 190 to 180 to $190,000. Uh, that's kind of COSA's core financial capacity in terms of revenue generation that we can expect from year to year as things stand currently. Uh, the sustainability plan that John discussed a few minutes ago would set us on a path toward trying to increase that capacity so that we have uh, a better ability to serve our members in between 
uh, federally funded or other otherwise funded uh, grant programs. And the next slide is going to show our expenses for those same periods. Uh, and you can see again that same trend line as we continue to uh, decrease those services. And you could take about 20,000 off of that 201 460 uh, that represented the last of some IMLS grant expenses. And again, it would get you back to somewhere between 180 and 190 in terms of our core capacity as we stand right now as an organization. If you have any questions about that, you can feel free to shoot them to me and I'll be happy to answer those by email or phone. I will turn it over to Jim Corden for an advocacy report. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Um, so it's my pleasure to serve this past year as the chair of the advocacy committee for COSA and the chair of the joint advocacy committee for COSA, RAC, uh, SAA, and NAGARA. Um, some updates for you quickly on Congress. Um, we have a couple of things going on. First, Jason Chaffetz, who has been a nemesis for NHPRC, has left Congress and returned to Utah. Um, he's been replaced by Trey Gowdy, who is from South Carolina. Um, and we've been working with uh, that committee to try and um, develop stronger relations for both NARA and NHPRC. Um, we're also pleased that the new representative from the House of Representatives to the NHPRC is Congressman Mark Meadows from North Carolina. Congressman Meadows also serves as the chair of the um, Freedom Caucus, the most conservative part of the Republican uh, membership, which is actually a good thing for us because he's a huge supporter of NHPRC and has done some things already to help us try to get funding. Um, speaking of federal funding, NARA is taking about a 6% um, reduction in the House approved version of the budget for the next fiscal year. Um, they've made some reading room changes as far as hours in part in preparation for that. Um, it's about a $20 million reduction. Uh, COSA may work with the Joint Advocacy Committee to try and see if some of that money can be restored in the Senate version of the budget. NHPRC was approved for $4 million um, by the House. We anticipate the Senate will likely put us back in or put an NHPRC back in at $6 million and will likely end up at $6 million, uh, which is about a million dollars over where we've been traditionally in the past other than this last six months or so. Um, so that's all positive. NHPRC reauthorization. I think since 2010 or so, NHPRC has been operating without reauthorization. And so Senator Sullivan from Alaska, who is the Senate's representative to the NHPRC, is authoring reauthorization language. It basically takes the old reauthorization authorizing NHPRC to exist and adds a new piece, which would be interest to, of interest to all of you, which is that um, NHPRC will now have an additional member on its board the Council of State Archivists. So that is included in the language that's been being sent to the Senate. Um, it may hit the Senate floor as early as this week, depending on how long they stay in session this week. Uh, otherwise, when they return back from their August resource recess, it should be there. Um, the other big thing is that COSA's annual meeting in 2018 um, in Washington, D.C. with Nagara, RAC, SAA, um, the Joint Advocacy Committee is working on a program for us to go, for some of us to go to Capitol Hill and do some lobbying during that conference or at the front end of that conference. All the details haven't been worked out, but COAST will probably be playing the lead because we have the most advocacy expertise. And so we'll be bringing delegations up to meet with key congressional offices and their staff um, advocating on behalf of the archives community as a whole. and. So all that's being developed as we speak. Um, it'll be rolled out, though, well before the meeting next July. Um, we are also working to help make sure that IMLS, NEH, and NEA funding, we, the COSA as an organization has been working to support those efforts to make sure that there's funding going to those organizations as well. And lastly, uh, this year, Jody Foley from Montana will be the board representative to the Advocacy Committee and will be serving as co-chair for advocacy this year. And I think with that, I'll turn my time back over. So thank you all very much. 
Thanks, Jim. This is Ann Ackerson, and I'm pinch hitting for Matt Blessing, uh, outgoing chairman of the Development Committee. Um, I want to uh, begin by thanking Matt for his leadership and and the committee, which uh, this past year included Sandy Treadway from Virginia, Steve Excel from Washington State, and retired state archivist Julia Marks Young and Conley Edwards. They did a great amount of work uh, in their year um, together and um, have laid some uh, pretty terrific groundwork for going forward. Since the Boise meeting, we've welcomed Lizette Pelletier from Connecticut as the new committee chair. And she's already thinking and planning for the future. So if you'd like to join her in development efforts, please let Lizette or me know. This committee plans for and tracks membership income, individual or personal giving, and corporate support of projects and programs. And so I've provided a little statistics on the slide here to just kind of show you where we are. Um, the membership dues income uh, for 2017 uh, has uh, been robust. Uh, we're, we've had a very good year. Uh, we're still um, awaiting some dues from a few states, but not many. Most everyone is in that's planning to come in. And the really good news is that we've exceeded our budget by uh, more than $4,000. So we're very pleased about that. And we thank all of you um, from states who support COSA. Uh, please know uh, that um, a state or a territory does not have to pay annual dues in order to be considered a member of COSA, but the dues really help to uh, provide um, a lot of fuel for the engine of our work. We're currently in the midst of our summer annual appeal. We, we, uh, we host two appeals every year, one in the summer, one at the end of the year. This is an opportunity for um, individuals to make tax-deductible contributions of any amount uh, to COSA to help us um, along the way. Um, our total goal for the year is $6,000, and so our mid-year summer appeal goal is 3000 half that. And I'm delighted to report that as of today, we're now, um, we now stand a little more than $2,000 in contributions, so we're two-thirds to the way of our goal for the summer appeal. We hope that um, you take some time to think about participating. Um, we would love that. And last year's uh, summer and year-end appeals exceeded their goal of $6,000, total goal of $6,000, which was really great. Corporate sponsorships this year stand at almost $70,000. And those uh, sponsorships come from Ancestry, Family Search, FX Software, Preservica, Space Saver. Um, we had really, uh, really productive conversations with a number of uh, potential corporate sponsors, both in Boise and again uh, last week at SAA in Portland. And out of those two meetings, we have the potential of four to five new corporate sponsors. Um, so the development committee is going to be busy working on those uh, when they convene later this month. And lastly, foundations. It's a new frontier for COSA, uh, but we believe that we have, uh, particularly through the Siri uh, project, some wonderful opportunities to engage foundations um, with us. And so we're doing some preliminary research right now. We know that we've got a period of cultivation, uh, but we are hoping that we will be able to find a foundation who really appreciates the work that's going on with Siri, and will want to make a significant and perhaps long-term contribution to the stabilization and the growth of that program. So uh, lots happening. And again, I invite anyone who's listening who would like to join us um, in this kind of work to please let Lizette Pelletier or myself know. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shelley Thompson a COSA board member and chairperson of the Education and Training Committee. Shelley? Hi. Um, I just wanted to talk a couple of minutes about the activities of the Education and Training Committee. And everything that we do is um, geared toward keeping the membership informed and, and educated. And that couldn't be done without um, the help of the committee members, Lisa Spear, Kathy Popovich, Sarah Grimm, Alan Ramsey, and John Metz. So a thank you goes out to them for, for helping out with all of this hard work. Um, 
There are COSA webinars just about every month um, during the calendar year. Um, and this year it is going to be June. So next month um, we will be, well, actually, no, towards the end of this month we'll be having another web webinar on um, following into our, our grant based theme. And this year we launched the, the learning labs that occur a week after the main webinar. So you just need to stay in touch and find out um, the number that you need to call in so that you can follow up that week after the webinar with your specific questions that you might have for the speaker. It's really a great way to, to think about what you learned during the webinar and then follow up with um, any questions that you might have. So um, keep an eye out for that. And then also part of what Education and Training Committee does is keep the membership informed. And there's plenty of ways to do that. Sure that you are following on Facebook and Twitter and the listservs. And if you have any questions about any of those, be sure to um, get a hold of either Ann or myself, and we'll make sure to get you joined into one of those listservs. Um, the committee is going to start preparing for the webinar series for 2018. We like to get that done before the end of this year. So if you have any ideas or suggestions for the next year's Grant or the next year's webinar theme, please let me know. Uh, we also have some exciting things coming up that we're working on that we're not quite done yet, um, but we will be releasing a white paper that will be coming out fairly soon. So some exciting things that the Education and Training Committee is, is working on, and we would also welcome any new committee members. So if you're interested, um, get a hold of um, Ann or myself. I think that's it, so I'm going to turn over to John to talk about awards. We were really fortunate to have a number of good um, uh, submissions this year uh, for uh, the COSA awards. Uh, the first of those, um, first person was not able to attend at the annual meeting, um, but um, she did send a very nice thank you note uh, to us. Uh, Emily Squires has had a long career um, very productive career with the Maryland State Archives, and Tim was able to take, um, I think it was a bowl, uh, back to her um, as, as a symbol of that award. Um, for the advocacy, um, for Archives Award, the Library of Virginia had sort of had a tough year uh, with, uh, uh, with funding and staffing, and were able to recoup back, I think, all the funding and all but maybe a couple of the staff members um, in um, their struggles uh, to maintain their budget this year, and they received uh, the Advocacy Award. Um, Sydney Irby uh, from the Georgia Archives was the recipient um, for the Rising Star Award, but he also was not able um, to, to be there. Kind of an interesting story with him uh, in the fact that he had worked his way up from, a, uh, I think, an intern there, actually, while the facility was under dire straits. He volunteered and continued his position as a volunteer there and is now uh, about to become one of their electronic record staff there at the Georgia Archives. So a great story with that one as well. And Jack's not here to uh, for, me, for me to say, but congratulations to him uh, and his state TRAB board uh, for being awarded the COSA NHPRC TRAB Award of Merit uh, this year for the Massachusetts State Historical Records Advisory Board. Um, so some great recipients at this year's conference. Um, also mid-year we have uh, the COSA An uh, Ancestry Leadership Award. Um, and the folks that receive this award then come to the annual meeting and give presentations on the leadership development uh, opportunities um, that they have been uh, paid uh, to pursue as part of this award. And this year's recipients I think the board does a pretty good job of spreading these out when we can. We had three recipients um, there talking about the training they've received through the year. Um, and anyone that knows these three uh, individuals can see the benefit uh, of this kind of training over time or, or past recipients, I think. It, and I would just encourage you as the past chair of the awards uh, committee to, um, to consider um, submitting um, you know, I would say mid-tier staff members um, for consideration of these awards uh, for leadership and development activities. 
fairly open-ended and they can define it uh, in ways that are most appropriate for your archives. Um, so, uh, and as I said, other, uh, also, then they come back uh, at the annual meeting, which will be in D.C. this year, and do presentations on um, on what that they have learned and the avenues that they pursued um, to gain that leadership training. So, the deadline for those awards is November 1st. Um, I know that you will probably get some reminders sent out, emailed out to you, but I would encourage you to not even wait to do that. So, uh, and then I think I'm turning the floor back over to Tim. All right. Well, thank you, John. So now we have, uh, we're running just a couple minutes behind schedule, but uh, we have a minute or two for any questions or co comments from the audience. And how does, I'm sorry, uh, Becky, how does that work? Do I have to uh, turn my mic off? Nope. If anybody has a question, feel free to put it in the chat box or the Q&A box. That's usually the quickest. If you would prefer to speak to ask your question, you can just raise your hand and we will unmute you. Any questions? Any comments? Well, why don't I then just turn it over to uh, Barbara Teague. Barbara, are you uh, ready to roll with your introduction of our uh, guest this afternoon? Uh, yes, I have a few things to uh, go over before that. Uh, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the webinar series. We have some remaining uh, some remaining webinars in our series. We'll get back at the end of this month on our regular fourth Thursday of the month schedule. Uh, we moved this webinar so it wouldn't be in conflict with the SAA meeting last week. But we have a good lineup for our budgeting for grants webinar at the end of this month, which is part of the grants management series that Shelley mentioned. We'll follow it up with the Learning Lab conference call, and we'll be sending out information about registration for the for that webinar and how to sign on to the conference call. Then we'll, our next webinar in September is going to be a Shrab Town Hall, which we had another one earlier in the year where we'll have some information from NHPRC. We'll probably have some follow-up from the Shrab Symposium that took place in Boise and the work that's taking place after that. Uh, so be sure and get these on your calendar. Uh, we'll have another one in October at the end of the month, and I believe that will be the end of our webinar series. And we're looking at adding some additional webinars uh, where we're going to look at um, some information that states may be working on that, you know, it's not really a polished presentation. We just want to have something that we can show you, like a demonstration of a work in progress. So we'll be doing that probably over the rest of the year. Um, also, we have some other, um, oh, thank you, Becky, for changing the slide. Let me go back one more. Um, we have a couple more things coming up that people want to be aware of. We posted an NHPRC are running a symposium in September about government email and an age of risk, and we're working with people from state archives and federal archives who have information and who've really done a lot of work on email projects, and we'll, you'll get some more information about that as the time gets closer. There are a couple of other um, conferences coming up that you might be interested in. NDSA is in Pittsburgh in October, and one of our favorite conferences in the State Archives community, the Best Practices Exchange, is being hosted by the Massachusetts Archives, among other institutions in Boston, from November 6th through 8th. And just a reminder, those session proposals are due August 15th, and we really would, I've heard from Veronica Martzel, who is running most of the, uh, running the program committee and the host committee, that they really do want to adhere to the August 15th deadline, so please try to get those in as soon as possible. And I just wanted to turn it over now to Steve Frizzell. Steve is with Axiom Apex Software, and they're one of COSA's corporate sponsors. And Steve's going to describe some of the projects that he has working on with other state archives. Okay, well, thank you very much. This afternoon, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Axiom. 
Uh, Axiom is a comprehensive, change this slide here. Okay, Axiom is a comprehensive, fully integrated software solution for managing many of the functions of the state archives. It was originally developed by a state archive and it is specifically designed to meet the requirements of state archives. On the slide, you can see many of the uh, different functions that, that are incorporated into the Axiom system. I'll take just a minute to uh, mention a few things about uh, some of these, these uh, capabilities. Uh, in the area of managing archival holdings, uh, Axiom will allow you to describe your collections and your record series. So if you have collections in addition to your record series, you can, you can also describe them. And they're described using a uh, EAD hierarchy. You can also maintain and publish finding aids to your website in EAD XML format. You can accession your physical holdings uh, into the archives inventory. And you can um, create work orders for managing uh, the processing of your uh, archival holdings. In the area of managing agencies and contacts, you can maintain a, a comprehensive file of your record creators and other related entities. Uh, for your agencies, you can maintain biographical information and history, and you can publish that information to your website. You can also maintain uh, a file of all the contacts that are associated with that agency and their relationship to the agency. So all the records officers and other types of contacts that you would normally deal with for an agency can be maintained in the contacts file. And you can publish uh, a complete uh, description of your agencies and other types of entities in EAC CPF XML format as well. In the area of uh, maintaining and publishing your schedules, uh, Axiom supports maintaining both your general schedules and your series uh, or record specific schedules. So you can maintain them online in the system, uh, review them, take them through an approval process, a workflow for the approval process, and then uh, finally, once they're approved, you can actually publish them uh, to the website. We also have uh, capability for managing your uh, research room, uh, your patrons and research questions that you might uh, address in that area. Uh, there's a patron sign-on screen that allows every patron to log in and, and provide basic information about who they are, where they live, phone numbers, contact information, things like that. Uh, so the system maintains a complete file of patron information as well as history of their visits to your research room. Um, you can also use the system to make appointments for patrons who want to come in and, and uh, have a conference with, a, with an archivist. And uh, you can also research or, or rather maintain a history of all the questions that you research. Uh, you can track the resources that were used to respond to those questions. And, uh, and then finally, you can, uh, from the research room, you can order materials from your archive inventory. Uh, and return them back to the inventory. Uh, so if the patron needs uh, certain records, you can enter that into the system and it will um, take care of ordering and returning that, those records. Then the last uh, function I want to mention, I think it's not the last one, the record center management capability uh, maintains a complete inventory of your uh, record center boxes. It allows you to enter your record transfers, uh, check out boxes or folders from boxes, uh, return them back to inventory, check them in. And then, and of course, it does the retention and disposition processing functions that you need for the record center uh, inventory. We also have a, uh, a module for electronic record preservation. And this module, uh, like the others, is fully integrated with, uh, with Axiom. There's a web search capability that allows you to search your electronic records and, and display them on the website. You can ingest your records from either your desktop or from uh, designated server storage locations. Some of the things we do when you ingest records is we do format validation, virus checking, we extract the metadata from the records, um, and then we also uh, we accession them into the archives inventory so they're now 
available, searchable, viewable in your inventory. Uh, we perform checksum validation on a periodic basis to make sure your records are still intact. And we can do format migration as well from uh, one format to another. Um, so those are just a few of the uh, more important capabilities. You can see on the slide that there's much more than that that's included. And there's many more things that aren't on the slide. Even. So the system is very comprehensive and fully integrated. Slide. Okay, so who is Apex Software? Well, we are the company that supports Axiom. Uh, we're the developer and the distributor of Axiom. Um, we've been in business for almost 30 years now. Um, we'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary this coming March. So we've been around a long time, and we expect to be around for uh, a much longer time in the future. We are located in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, so we enjoy warm weather most of the year. And we've been a corporate sponsor of COSA for three years now. This slide highlights a few of the services that we offer. Um, the Axiom software is open source, but, but without the services that we offer, it would be very difficult to use. And so we do uh, offer all the services that you need to be able to uh, install and maintain Axiom. Uh, so we can we can install it on your server or on a cloud server if you prefer. We provide training for your staff. You can convert all of your existing data to the Axiom format. Uh, we can customize the system to meet your precise requirements. And we provide professional ongoing support through an 800 number or through email. So we're always available to answer any questions or provide any assistance that you might need while you're using the system. We have a total of four state archives that are using Axiom today or in various stages of uh, implementing it. Um, we did have our second annual user group meeting at uh, the COSA uh, um, annual meeting this year. So we had a, had a good uh, meeting and we talked about some of the opportunities for the archives to collaborate on projects uh, as we go forward with Axiom. So I think the, uh, that Axiom is proving to be a very, uh, very viable solution for state archives, and, uh, and, and we're happy to be a part of uh, the COSA organization. Um, if you would like more information about Axiom, uh, you can feel free to contact me directly. My email is on the slide there. Um, not quite as prominent, but down the bottom is my phone number and my direct extension if you would like to uh, give me a call. Uh, I look forward to hearing from any of you that might have any questions at all about, about Axiom. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I don't see anything right now, so I'll turn it back over to Ann. Or maybe Becky. Sorry, I'm here. This is Ann. Um, little technological glitch there. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I want to take an opportunity here to um, thank all of our corporate sponsors. Um, certainly, Steve and Epic Software have been critical to the work that we've been doing. But um, it's important for you all to know that each year, our corporate sponsors provide critical funding support for many of our membership activities and events, and we're especially grateful to Apex Software and our corporate sponsors featured here on this page, Ancestry.com, Family Search, Preservica, Space Saver, and Gaylord Archival. And the support of COSA's program initiatives is also generously provided by grants from the NHPRC and IMLS. The next slide uh, gives you a, a chance to find out how to, oh, I'm sorry, webinar evaluation. Um, when you leave the webinar today, uh, you will be taken uh, to a, an evaluation page, and we hope that you'll spend just a couple of minutes on that evaluation page providing us uh, information, feedback about this webinar, um, about what you'd like to see in future webinars, 
uh, the Education and Training Committee uses that information uh, when we're getting together to think about themes for webinars and we'll be doing so uh, in the next month or two as we begin to plan out the 2018 member webinar series. So I would appreciate um, your taking some time for that. And then the next slide, I think, tells you how to stay connected and informed with us. We operate on a variety of platforms, not as many as some, but um, all good ones. Um, we have an active Facebook page, uh, an active Twitter account, and of course you can find out information on our website and the PERTS portal. So those are uh, four ways to keep in contact with us going forward. But you can always reach out to me. You can reach out to any of our any of the the presenters today. Our board members are um, Tim Baker, our president, to Barbara Teague, to Becky Julson. We're all here to support um, you in your quest for information and and networking and that sort of thing. So please feel free to to use us and stay in touch with us. And I think that that's our last slide. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. Uh, the wrap-up is always something that I enjoy. Um, of all the webinars, it's one that I just love hearing all the reports all over again. <laughs> all over again. And uh, we hope that you uh, enjoyed it as well. So stay in touch with us. We hope to see you back here later this month for our uh, next uh, grant management webinar and the following week for the Learning Lab. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Frizzell. Um, so we'll see you in a few weeks. Take care, everybody.